Yeah, let's go to Second Peter chapter three, please. Second Peter chapter three. And the Apostle Peter says here, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord, and we thank you for this chance for us to come together here at Bible Baptist Church to learn more about you and your word. And Father, as it says, he fills with the Spirit of God to illuminate us with regards to how God views time. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all things, especially for the salvation that was given by your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. This morning, we'll continue our studies here in the seven things that Christians shouldn't ignore. And interestingly enough, the Apostle Peter decides to give us one um, here this Sunday morning. And it's tied to the doctrine of last things. It's tied to understanding what's to come. And he tells the brethren, look, don't be ignorant that to the Lord a thousand years as a day, and a day is a thousand years. You wonder, what is all that about? Um, but we'll see in a minute here. Um, that understanding how God views time can be a comfort and can bring a hope to you um, as a Christian. Because it reminds you that you know, everything's kind of falling into place, that God has, is in control that we're not going to be stuck here for the next million years or anything like that with this kind of problem, for example. Okay. All these things can be reconciled if you are not ignorant of this. Now, if you are, you know, you're going to get a lot of stuff wrong about end times. You're not going to think Jesus is going to be coming back soon. A lot of that stuff won't fall into place. Okay. And so the question becomes, how do I even interpret what he's saying here? And I'm just going to say this, and then we'll look at the verses and kind of piece it out. But it seems like time for God, or he's out of the third heaven, is different than it is here. Okay? One day with the Lord up there is like a thousand years, and a thousand years down here is like a day to him. Okay? And this will help you. Let's go to some verses. Go to Genesis 1 in one hand and Psalm 90 in the other. Psalm 90 in Genesis 1, and we'll see here what the Apostle Peter is quoting. This is what's ironic. People talk about how Peter doesn't really, you know, he's just a fisherman. He's not really that, doesn't learn anything smart. He's not that intelligent. Well, he brings up something here that's way beyond anything Paul wrote about. And this goes to show you, it's, you know, God can bring anybody up in terms of intelligence and all that type of thing once they're walking with him. Okay, and this idea that only smart people can get these deeper things just isn't true. This isn't true. Uh, Genesis 1 in Psalm 90. And the Apostle Peter, he's citing in Psalm 90 this psalm that's attributed to Moses, I believe. Yes, prayer of Moses, the man of God. So this goes as far back as him. Okay. And Moses talking about the Lord, he says in verse 4, Psalm 90, verse 4, For a thousand years in thy sight, this is how he views it, I but as yesterday, what it is past, like a day. And, another comparison, as a watch in the night. We'll come back to that and explain that in a second. But you can get the gist here that it seems like for God, you know, this much time doesn't, you know, isn't really much to him. And I think everybody gets that. But the question is whether you take the similitude a little more seriously. Okay. Yes, it says as. It doesn't say like. Okay, so is that an equal sign? Uh, that's the question. Okay. Go to Genesis 1. Genesis 1. In verse 1. We learn here in the creation story that we've been covering on um, Sunday mornings with preacher. We've been going through Genesis. He said weeks back, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And here is that creative act. But notice that in verse 1, God created the uni verse. One verse. The whole thing was made. Now you know where the word comes from. Okay, it's biblical. Universe. Okay. And notice he created the entirety of it, the heaven and the earth. It's all there. 
Okay. And then for some reason something happens, there's darkness, we don't really know what's going on there. Okay. That's a discussion amongst uh, Christians at times. But going to verse 6 here. Verse 6, get to the second day. And God says here, and God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Long story short, there was darkness upon the face of the deep, and waters were put in there, and then he had to put something in there to separate the waters. And this thing is firm, and it's firmament, okay? As mass can cause things to be pushed out, just like water can take up physical space. Notice water could be there without the firmament. Okay, so space was there. Okay. Now you got this firmament thing. Okay. And notice in verse 8, and God called the firmament heaven with a capital H. So you had a heaven in verse 1, now you got this heaven here. Well, what's going on there? Okay, well, maybe there's more than one. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Okay. And then if you were to jump, I didn't put this here, but I just want to show it. Let's see, in verse 20, day 5, And God said that the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Now we got this other heaven here that's open and the birds can fly in it. So let me translate this into our language today. Okay, open firmament of heaven is the atmosphere. Birds fly in there. Okay, the firmament is outer space. At least that's what we call it. Okay. But apparently God put that there to separate waters from waters. The waters on the earth are part of that amount of water that was there in the beginning, and there's waters above it. Okay. And then there's this other heaven, Genesis 1. That would be the third. I thought the third wasn't created. I don't know about that. A lot of discussions there. But I can see three right there. Okay. And I bring this up because right now we're in the firmament. We're being affected by it. Okay? It's what determines our physics. It also means it determines what space-time is like. Okay? I'm trying to make this not physics-like as much as I can. but The point is, the third heaven is separated from here. And you can have different views of time. If the firmament is what's controlling how, how the things are ticking at the moment. Remember the sun, which is used to, to tell you time in the day, and the moon, which is tied to the night, rules the night, and the stars, these things are embedded in the firmament, and we use them to measure time. Okay. But that's different than what God's using. He's up there in the third one. Okay. And so oftentimes what you end up seeing as you're learning prophecy and reading is that God talks about things shortly coming to pass and all this, and you're wondering, this is taking long, Lord been 2,000 years but to him it's only been a few days and he's not lying to you either it really has been a few days for him okay. if you have loved ones who are presently with the Lord you might think man it's been like 50 years since I've seen you they'll be like no it's only been 10 minutes I've just been praising God and he just came up because they're up there they're not they're not embedded in our time okay. if you take that seriously it just depends on how seriously you take that okay and I'll just say this, but this isn't the focus here. A watch in the night. When you study that out, you'll find out that it can be three hours or four hours, depending on watch. You can have four watches in the night, or three, because it's 12 hours in the night. Okay. And if you think about that, three or four, you can group that in terms of something called the day theory. Now, where does, it, where does that come from? Genesis 1, God created in seven days. Everybody asks you, why do you do it that way? Okay. As a Christian, what you end up discovering, I'm going to show you this today, okay, is that God did that on purpose so you, we as Christians can look at it as a model and try to understand history through it. Okay. And it's not a surprise that time will be grouped in groups of three and groups of four, because in 4,000 years, that's when the Son of Man came. Okay, that's when he came in first coming. And then in three, that's the end. Okay. So that's kind of what's going on there. Now go to Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. I don't want to dig too deep in that. I just want to show you the why you shouldn't be ignorant. It wants to be the focus. And those other things we can discuss in more depth outside of this message. But Peter didn't want you to be ignorant of this because he wants you to have hope. 
God. And so when you read Revelation 1 and verse 1, so we're all the way on the other side now. It's like everything's coming full circle, if you will, from Genesis to Revelation. Revelation 1 and verse 1, notice that John writes here the revelation of Jesus Christ. But I thought it was John's. Well, Jesus gave it to John. Okay. Which God gave unto him. God gave it to Jesus, and then Jesus gave it to John. That's what I think should happen here. Okay. To show unto his servants, like John, things which you must notice shortly come to pass. And you're like, what do you, what do you mean shortly? Well, when you read the Revelation, Jesus Christ is up there in the third heaven. Now it makes sense. Get it? It really is shortly. It really is soon. Okay. This isn't taking it isn't taking God long to come down here. Okay, but we think he is because it's taken over two thousand years at this point, at least it seems like it. For it's only a few days. God. So now you can believe that. Notice these things must shortly come to pass. Not, not that they may. So he's really straight stating a very blunt truth. And it also gives you confidence in the items of Revelation that they're going to happen. This is one of the must in Scripture I didn't preach. When I preached that message on the must in Scripture. This one to scare people. Yeah, Revelation is a rough book for people who don't believe. Okay, if you believe, you know you're not going to be part of that. And so from God's perspective, yeah, I'm coming soon. Don't worry about it. I got it all handled. Are you ignorant of this, Christian? Yeah. Then maybe you'll get caught up in the right now. And then you'll get choked by it. Okay? Instead of resting in what I've given you about the hereafter. So you can focus on living for me. That's why Peter brought it up. Okay? Now I'm just going to mention some of these things since we're talking about time. I couldn't resist. Okay? You might wonder, what is time made up of? Okay, does the Bible give you an answer to that? Because if you go to a scientist and ask them what is time, they'll tell you, I can't answer that question. Talk to a philosopher. They don't know what it is. They're right. Okay? Einstein didn't tell you what time is. He just told you that time could dilate and so can lengths. So one inch can become less than one inch at times, according to him. And a second can be longer than a second, but it's still a second. You can't really tell. Uh, that, that's, that is what they're saying. Okay? What God is showing you is that time is absolute because it's tied to him. And maybe that's not what's going on. Maybe they're measuring something tied to the firmament, not necessarily what actually is time. So what is time? Okay, well, the constituents are in Luke 4. Check this out. Luke 4 and verse 5. Let me show you what that God gives you a word for this. Then you do with it what you will. Okay. And what this will help you is when you talk to Christians who start talking about how, you know, God sees all of time and, you know, for God there is no time. You know, let's just correct all that right now. Okay, Luke 4, verse 5. It's kind of weird. They're just really just not thinking too much. I mean, Jesus was here. So it's kind of weird. How can you say he was here? See that? But Luke 4, and verse 5. This time will happen with the Lord, and it says, And the devil, taking him, that's Jesus, up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world, notice, in a moment of time. There you go. Times are made up of moments. Okay. What's a moment? Well, we talked about um, the rapture a few days ago, and we found out that in a moment, comma, in the twinkling of an eye. Like that, that's how quick it is. Here we go. Blinking. Okay? A moment's instantaneous. We all understand this when we talk about the present moment. Okay? Now, this will help you because God says, I am that I am. That's his name. See that? He is the present God. He's ever present. reason why he inhabits eternity is because eternity is the present moment. Does that make sense? There never was a time where God wasn't. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. Okay? And so the devil, in one moment, he flashed before Jesus' eyes what would happen if you worship him. That's, that's what happened. Okay? So there wouldn't be time to put a TV screen like some people preach. No, it's just it's put it in his mind. Okay? That's what happened. But of course, the Lord ended up telling him, what did he say there? <laughs> Get thee behind thee, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only him shalt thou serve. 
He was telling him, no, you worship me, not the other way around. So yeah, Muslim, he did say it was God. There you go. Okay, if you needed that. But here's the point. Okay? Time is made up of moments. Okay? Now I'm going to give you some philosophy here. A moment, how do you define that? A moment is a state of affairs, or the way things are. Okay? But guess what? They could be something different. Right? If I were to freeze frame right now, the entire universe, that's a moment. But they could change. And that next moment is what we lump together. We take these moments and we organize them. And that organization is what we call the flow of time. Okay? Now, who does that? God does. Okay? So me saying God is in time is not me trying to imprison God. It's because he's the Lord of it. He's the one that makes it happen. Okay? There wouldn't be other moments if God didn't decide that they would be there. And it wouldn't be sequential in order if he wasn't there to put them together. Okay. So we hear a lot of preaching, but nobody really thinks about what they're talking about. That's what I'm trying to get at. And that's important, okay? Because that explains why God is omnipresent. Does that make sense now? Okay. Why is he everywhere? Because there is no when nor where where he wouldn't be. He's the one that Organize the space. He's the one that is the Lord of time. Okay, omnipresence is the combination of those two things. Okay. Lastly, that means that the future doesn't exist right now. So are people talking about God looks at the future as if it's there, that, that doesn't that's not biblical. Okay. He knows it, but he didn't have to look at it. Otherwise that moment's there. Okay. Can you imagine? Okay. Give you, I'll just use myself. Me at 60 years old, actually existing right now, just like I do right now. That's what you'd have to believe if God is looking at the future literally. Okay, that, that doesn't really click. Okay. What if the past is really there? Well, then Jesus is still dying on the cross from God's perspective up there. That doesn't work either. He can't defeat death if he's still dying to it. Okay. That answers all those weird questions. So that's why that's interesting. But now go to Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38. We can keep digging, but we won't. Isaiah 38. Let's look at a really interesting miracle here. And I'll, I'll keep Genesis 1 in my hand. I'll just read the portion. That way you guys don't have to turn. But in Isaiah 38... What you find here is Hezekiah is sick unto death, and he prays to God to spare him and give him mercy. Okay? And God says he hears his prayer, and he tells him, let him ask for a sign. Okay? And then Isaiah goes to him and asks about the sign, and then uh, Hezekiah responds. But this is what he offers to him. Isaiah 38, verse 7. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Okay, so Hezekiah ends up asking for this. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which has gone down the sundial of Ahaz ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees, by which degree it was gone down. And they used sundials to tell time. So what ended up happening was, in order to prove to Hezekiah that he would heal them, God made the, the shadow go back 10 degrees, which is about 40 minutes. If you do the math. Okay. Now, I got a question for you. Okay. Let's assume that that really turned back time. Okay. So, go back 40 minutes. Now, Isaiah's talking to Hezekiah, so what do you want? And then Hezekiah's like, okay, yeah, I'd like you to do this, Lord. Get back there. The Lord turns back time again. And now you got Groundhog Day. Right? If the sun is what makes time what it is. That's not what happened. Okay? The measurement, the sun is used to measure time. That went back. That's true. But time itself kept going. See what I'm getting at? Time and its measurement are different. Okay? Now this gets into, into physics now because in special relativity they try to tell you 
okay, that time could dilate and extend and contract, but that's how they measure it. What they don't tell you is they use the speed of light as their standard measure. That's why time and lengths can change, because they want to fix speed. If I fix time, then the speed of light would change. Does that make sense? But they made a decision, okay, and Einstein had his reasons. There's more to that. I can tell you that C is actually an average. And that's useful for apologetics. People complain about distance starlight. Well, technically, if you understand that the speed, speed C is a two-way speed, okay, and we can't measure the one-way speed of light, then that means you can decide, you can pick what measuring stick you want. That's like we can pick uh, meters or we can pick feet. We, we do this all the time. Oh, I want to make it so that C is instantaneous to me so I can follow God's timing. And then it's C over 2 going over there to the star. There would be no problem. Okay. That's apologetics for one. Okay. But that doesn't, all I'm trying to show you is that doing that doesn't explain what time is. Okay. So don't, don't let them get you. Okay. Ask them, do you know what time is? Okay. They won't know. As a Christian, you can literally say God is the Lord of time. He is the one that makes moments and makes them sequential. That's what time is. A sequence of them put together. Just answer the question. Okay. Now, putting all that aside, why should we not ignore it? Go to Matthew 16. Let me show you what Jesus told these guys. Matthew 16. They weren't paying attention to what God was doing. They weren't paying attention to how God was viewing things. And so in Matthew 16 and verse 1, this is why Peter brings it up. In that same chapter I read you, he would start it off the chapter saying, all these people are saying that Everything's the same from right now in the past. It hasn't changed. It's uniformitarian is what, what he's arguing against there. Nothing's changed since the beginning of creation. He's trying to tell them, no, that's not true at all. In uh, 2 Peter 3. But here the Lord says in Matthew 16, verse 1, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Okay, and we were talking about signs. It's all tied to signs. Jesus, show us a sign. He knows Jesus answered the son of them. <laughs> when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. So notice the sky is red in two different times. And when they see it red in the sunset, yeah, we're going to have good weather now. It's going to be nice, you know, nice and relaxing, you know, 60 something, 65 degrees. Go out there, get a fire going like we did yesterday. Okay? But in the morning, if it's still red and lowering, no, we know it's going to be a rough day. So they seem to understand when they look at a sign and they correlate it to what's going on in time, they understand what it's talking about with the weather. Because people will go to them because they're scientists and ask these questions. Okay? And then the Lord says in verse 3, Oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the sign of the times. Okay. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, and he left them and departed, and he even bothered them. Now, what's that sign? Resurrection. Same sign we deal with in 2023. Never been disproved. It is falsifiable. It's never been disproved. People haven't found his body. Okay. There's so much eyewitness testimony, it's unbelievable. Okay. Both in the scriptures and outside of it. And every single person in here that's saved knows it's real. Okay. They weren't paying attention to what was going on. Even though he was right there. Okay. Are you paying attention to what's going on in the world right now? Does this look like we're in peace? Okay. Even in our own community, we deal with things. And people have gone off the rails in 2023. Okay. And yet we still try to save faith and say, this stuff doesn't affect me directly, therefore it's not really happening. I don't have to worry about it. Don't have to pay attention to it. Just living in my own little world. The Lord says, pay attention. You know what the sign is? You know what the times are? Okay. You're not going to live forever. Not without me, anyway. Do you see me? Okay. 
Do you see that we're getting close to World War III? In fact, some people argue it's happening, what's going on in Ukraine, okay? I mean, depends on how you look at that. I think World War III is Ezekiel 38 and 39, that's another discussion complete. Okay. World War I and II were 36 and 37 for those who do study prophecy. Okay, so those are in there. Okay. And Peter wants us alert to recognize what's going on in our world to help us see where we are, okay, historically and all that, and in prophecy, and then act in kind with that because as we approach World War III, we're also approaching the coming of our Savior. And that should give you hope and comfort and joy, okay, and motivate you to witness your loved ones, okay. That's the idea here. That's what he's getting at, okay. And God wants us to see this. They weren't connecting and seeing God's work with his son, even though they were in the fourth day. Okay, it had been 4,000 years since Adam when this happened. Okay? And they weren't recognizing everything the Messiah was showing them. Okay? Likewise today, we need to pay attention to what Jesus is showing us so we can make a decision about it. And please, choose life. Choose Jesus. Okay? Now, go to Job 24. Let me show you this. Job 24. Where does the day theory come from? Do people just make it up? We just like to find patterns and make them up? That's a good question. Okay, because I've talked to many Christians who bring up the day theory, and then I ask them why they call it a theory, and they're like, well, we're not totally sure, and I'm like, don't you know there's a Bible verse on this? They're like, what? Yeah, why teach it if you don't even know if it's true? Okay. Job 24, now this is Job, this is the oldest book chronologically. Okay, Job seemed to know about this. In Job 24, verse 1, here we got Job talking. He says, why? Seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, God knows what's going on. Do they that know him, that's supposed to be us, not see his days? No, he tells you about them that they exist. See that? Job knew about him. God's wondering why we don't. See? Okay. So the days of the Almighty are real. Okay. Now I have here Galatians 4 verse 4. I'll just read it. Notice the Bible says, But when the fullness of the time was come, that's when God sent forth His Son made of a woman under the law. We have to understand the times to know that the fullness of time was come. Okay, why didn't God wait till 6,000 years after Adam? Why didn't he just do it right after, why, with uh, Eve's first uh, children? Why didn't, why, didn't, why didn't he do it then? Okay, because God had a plan. Okay. Go to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1. Notice what the Apostle Paul says here. Hebrews 1 and verse 1 says, God, who in sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, what do you mean last days, Lord? It's been 2,000 years. God, spoken to us by his son. So when the son came, the fullness of time had been completed. And then the son is coming apparently in the last days. Now, how does that work? Okay. But once you know about the days of the Almighty, you go back to Genesis 1. There's seven days there. And if four are done, that's 4,000 years there, right? Four times a thousand. You only got three left, last days. That's how you do it. See that? That's why his son spoke to us in the last days. He's within the three. Because he, he was born in 4,000 a.m. is how they call it. And he died in 4033. Okay. You see that? If you don't have that, God's timetable, that none of that will make sense. Okay? Now, I know the brother and brother will say the last days, that's referring to the tribulation period, and it refers to both. They want to exclude the first one, because they know about it, and they admit it, and then they don't want to focus on it. You can't exclude them. They're both true. Okay? But God writes that way. Okay? He's multi-layered. He's a, the best editor in the universe. Okay? That should make sense, right? It's only God. But he does this. See? And this is where dispensationalism comes from. 
this is why it's biblical. This is why people look at these different these seven day things because it's literally scripture. Okay, and a Christian who believes in dispensationalism is showing that they're listening to Peter. Does that, does that make sense? So most Christians don't listen to Peter, and they're wondering why the world is going awry and why isn't God acting? They don't even know where they're at in God's plan. See that? They'll talk about building the kingdom when all they should be doing is witnessing. They're being good and helping others. That's it. Okay. So Peter wrote something very profound. Okay. And to get a little deeper for those who are wondering, what days did Job know about? Because he didn't know about all seven. Okay, he knew about at best three historically. Think about what Enoch said. That'll help you. Okay. Go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. <clears throat> so we got the days of the Almighty. And then we got a reference to the day of God in the Bible. And people wonder why is the seventh day separated from the other six? Okay. Now let's look at that. Genesis 2 and verse 1. Genesis 2 and verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. So before there was a heaven in verse 1, now there's heavens, because there's three now. See that? That didn't require anything fancy. Verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. And the seventh day is separate, and it's a day of rest, and he hallows it, and he separates it so much he puts in a different chapter. Okay. Now, as a Christian, in the seventh day, in this between 6,000 and 7,000 years, a thousand years, what do you call that? Okay. Call that the millennium. Right? See that? And you know, the reason why God's wrestling is because Jesus is reigning in the millennium. Isn't that right? So that's where that comes from. Okay. And God separates it from the rest because man was running things and we messed up for 6,000 years and God's going to run stuff and he's going to do a great job. No, in fact, a perfect one. Okay. But as a Christian, if you don't think about that, you're going to think we're going to just continuously, you know, continue on this, this downward spiral and God's not going to act. Okay. You may not even believe that revelation is, must shortly come to pass. You may think all of that is spiritual. And Peter's telling him, no, don't think that way. You need to be looking forward to these things. Okay. You need to know how God is viewing time and notice your place in it. Peter knew he was within the fourth and fifth day. He knew that. And so he focused on witnessing, starting churches. See that? He didn't act like he was already a king ruling. He knew that right now he was acting like a prophet. He was an apostle. He was sent to preach. Okay. Now I got some verses here. Let's just go to 2 Peter 3. Just look at that one. I'll, I'll quote the other ones for you. Because this might be new for a lot of people here. But 2 Peter 3. I'm going to go to verse 12. I'll, I'll go ahead and run to the Revelation verse. The days according to the Bible are separated between evenings and mornings. Okay. And that's why you have the day of the Lord reference in the Old Testament talking about the tribulation period, which is pretty dark, and also the millennium, which is pretty light. And it's pretty, pretty beautiful. But they're both the day of the Lord. Because days are made up of evenings and mornings. Okay. And in 2 Peter 3 and verse 12, notice that Peter admits, okay that you should be looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, where the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Okay. So should you be looking for that? Then he also says in verse 13, 
Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And he's looking for that. He's focused on that. And we'll, we'll conclude with the verses that say why you should care. Okay. All Revelation 16, verse 14 does is show you that the day of God Almighty is tied to him judging the Antichrist. That's why that verse is there. And then the Revelation 20 verse shows you that you as a Christian, you're not, you know, you're part of the first resurrection, the second death hath no power. Okay. And it says there, if I read it. Right. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such a second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Because they're like a day. That makes sense. God. It's not a surprise that people who don't, who ignore this, are amillennials. Amillennials. Well, it's not a surprise. Okay, they're not paying attention to God's days. So of course they don't believe in the morning. Well, God is, we tend to, I've actually read this. They say they technically believe that they do believe in a millennium since so God is reigning right now. And that's a very strange statement. <laughs> okay, I'll just, I'll just leave it there. Scholarship is interesting. Academia can be weird sometimes. Okay. So we're in 2 Peter 3, right? It should still be there. 2 Peter 3, let's conclude with this. So Peter brings up all this interesting stuff. He just kind of says it. Don't be ignorant of this. God's going to actually destroy everything with uh, the elements, with fervent heat and all this, the earth, when they're less there, uh, therein. Okay. But he says in verse 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. That's why he brought it up. We always quote verse 9. Go there. Verse 9. We quote verse 9 and say, Look, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us word. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But we quote that, and that's based on the fact that to God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Okay. One reason why God made time different for us is so he can long suffer and work with us. Okay. And yet he doesn't want it to be forever, so it's so short for him up there. Okay. See that? And Peter is saying, look, if you know about these things, then that'll motivate you to witness. That'll motivate you to be diligent. That'll keep you in peace despite all the chaos around you. That'll make you focus on living without spot, being blameless. Because okay. when you start thinking like God, you start realizing that your life is like a vapor. That this is quick. This isn't forever. That when you're living with the Lord in your new body forever, this is going to seem like it was a moment. And he wants you to apprehend that now. Okay. He doesn't want you to get lost in the sauce of this world, because this world is going to get you caught up with all kinds of problems. Instead, focus on and set your affection on things above. Instead, recognize your place in the plan of God, so you can focus on doing that. Okay. And know that God's coming soon. That's, that's basically why he cares. Okay. So Christian, do you align with Peter? Apparently, Paul agrees with them. That's what Peter's saying there, too. Okay. And we've kind of seen that. Okay. But if you agree with Peter and Paul, then maybe you shouldn't think that God has taken forever. Maybe you should recognize that God's got it all handled. Okay. Don't worry about these things. Okay. Don't focus on the pandemics and depression. I'm sure they're going to start another one here soon. Okay. Focus on Jesus Christ and the fact that he's going to appear very soon for you to pull you out here. Okay. So Christian, do you view time the way God does? Okay. I didn't bring this up, but I'll just tell you, Job, you know Job said that after he lost all his, 
his family and all his wealth and his health? And he said that? And he's telling his friends who were there supposed to comfort him and instead of were causing him more torture. How do you not know what God is doing? He was telling him. God. We've never suffered like Job. Nobody, nobody actually will. Only Jesus suffered more than he did. Okay. And he's saying, we need to pay attention on God's days. Okay. We need to be circumspect. Okay. And recognize, despite the trials that are going on, there is something in the future for us that's greater than in any of the suffering that we're partaking of at the moment. There's a joy that's set before us. Okay. Let us pray. So Heavenly Father, we do thank you for taking a look at time, and I understand that this lesson was a little more abstract, I guess, Lord, but I'm glad that you gave us revelation to look at on this topic. And more importantly, you've shown us why you want us to care about how you look at things. Because if we look at things the way you do, all of a sudden, everything will seem like it's short and it's soon to come to pass. So help us to do that, Lord, and help us to reorientate our lives uh, in accordance with that perspective so that we can live for you more and more. And we give you thanks and praise, Father, for all things, especially for the salvation that was given by your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.